just like the picture says, the wait is Casper over. Gary Kasparov is back and surprisingly playing some, maybe not surprisingly, but playing some super high quality chess at the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. We're going to dive into the most instructive moments from yesterday's games. He drew against Sergei Karyakin and Hikaru Nakamura uh, and uh, just played phenomenal chess overall. Uh, definitely competing against the world's best, maybe like some I think yours truly didn't really expect he'd be able to do. But he started off strong. We'll see how he finishes. Uh, today he gets to play Levon Aronian, so uh, that, that should be a tough matchup. So we're going to dive into that, talk about the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, show some of the more instructive moments that happened yesterday. But as we do first and foremost on the Chess Today show, all of you know the drill. There's nothing else, nothing else that anybody is waiting for besides the besides the uh, the daily puzzle. So uh, just checking in with the chat here, making sure that everybody is ready to rock. And uh, here we go. Let's do it. The daily puzzle. It's on. Game on, as they say. All right, what do we got here for me to for me to attempt to solve today? White to play, tactics and consolidation. Okay, that's that sounds a little pretentious, if you ask me, but uh, but we'll assume that there's a point to that. Obviously, we're looking at potential back rank issues. We're looking at potential discoveries on the queen. Not exactly sure off the top of my head where the winning discovery would be if that is indeed the move. If we move the knight, the queen can gobble up our knight. There's no rook takes d6 because the knight guards e8 checkmate. Um, let's see here. Knight e7 check looks fun. But after bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, then what? Right? Um, so let's see. The material count is actually equal right now outside of white's extra a pawn. So uh, we're, not, we're not down a ton of pieces, but I already feel like I'm, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank here, considering that I just don't have an answer right off the top of my head. A little frustrating. Queen to e7 is interesting. Sort of, right? Uh, queen comes to e7, and if he captures, we play bishop takes e7. And, uh, and just like that, the, uh, the game continues. Sorry, closing out of my sounds there from Twitch and Twitter. Um, uh, some people already saying this one is hard. I don't think you're going to get it. That's good. Nice vote of confidence there. Um, unless you're unless you're a cheater, you already did it. No, I did not do it yet. <laughs> I never do these things before. Haven't you? Haven't you followed the show, Chess Beast, and watched me fall flat on my face? I never solve these things ahead of time. That would take away from the authentic experience. Um, okay. Yeah, this is this is a little tricky. Okay, so moving the knight again without a forceful option, the, our queen is also hanging. I'm going to go back to this move, queen e7. It forks, it forks the rook and bishop, right? And if they ta capture our queen, we take and fork. King moves, we trade on on d5. And the one reason why I sort of you know assess the the, the importance of this outside pass a pawn is worst case scenario. If this is truly a tactic that's about simplification and just converting on the current advantages, and there is no other sort of knockout blow, which is always kind of rare in a daily puzzle. Um, if that's the case, then then maybe queen e7 is indeed a worthy candidate move. Um, let me let me think outside the box here. Our knight is hanging on e on f5. If knight e7 check, bishop takes e7. Moving the knight is not really an option. Queen takes e7, bishop takes d3, and then what? Um, the more I look at the position, the more I feel like queen e7 is the most straightforward idea. Um, hmm. What about a move like bishop h6? Is that too crazy? The queen can take f5. That's the biggest problem. Um... Let's go back to queen e7. Are there other moves I'm just missing? Like bishop takes h2 check, king takes h2. That doesn't seem to be ideal for him. All right, yeah. Queen e7, bishop takes, knight takes, king f8, knight takes d5. 
rook takes d5. I mean, it's so hard to go for something like that. I mean, my knight is, I mean, I'm up a pawn. I'm actually up two pawns in that position. And if I move the knight to f2 and he has to trade and I take again, I mean, it's a, it's a winning endgame. So if I came up with the move queen e7 in a game and calculated that there's no other obvious tactics, you know, to punish me for putting my queen essentially on pre, um, I'd probably go for it. So let's do it. Okay, shocker. All right. So he plays rook to d7, clearly to avoid the endgame I just talked about, which is kind of nice. But does it really avoid the endgame if I play queen takes d6 now? Right? Queen takes d6. If he takes with the knight, if he takes with the rook, I have knight e7 check. Um, would there be other options here to punish him for not capturing my queen? Something like queen takes f6 seems unreasonable. There's nothing. There's no other forcing tactic here. Queen takes d6 is the most logical continuation given the combination that we already started. All right, look at that. Okay, so now there has to be the move. Knight takes d5 seems like the only option. So this was the position I originally calculated for those of you who've been with the Chess Today Show. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I, I, don't, I, I didn't see anything better in this situation visually in my head than knight f2. The knight is hanging, but the knight is also pinned. Um, a6, he, you know, there may be options for him to take the knight, but also he could just gobble the a6 pawn, and I see nothing. So I think that what, what White's best options are here, and this may be a puzzle that kind of highlights when you, when you really don't have much else going for you, sometimes you have to solidify. And I guess the, the title says consolidate. So take that, chess beast. Take that, chess beast, in your face, homie. Boom! Right, you know what I'm saying? That's right. I may not be able to solve a mate in three, but I can darn sure see some tactics and consolidate, okay? I can darn sure consolidate my position when I'm on the edge. So there you go. <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, I'm not really that proud of it, but uh, it did take me a little long. But this was definitely a hard one in the sense that, you know, if you look back at the beginning, you're, it's not, this is not your everyday daily puzzle, right? This is not a straightforward combination and, and deliver the goods. This is more like a tactics trainer problem, right? Solving puzzles is, is great because of the practical nature of, of sometimes you have to defend and consolidate, right? This is a scenario where really white is almost in a little bit of trouble with the knight under fire, the rook and, and, and queen lined up in this battery here. So, um, I saw queen e7 pretty quickly for those of you who've been here, but it was hard for me to believe that that could be the move. It's like, eh, right? I mean, you got to wait a second and uh, uh, before you taste the soup. So, um, anyway, this is um, this is the start of the chess today show. As we always do, we introduce the big news topic. How excited are all of you to seeing? The one, the only Gary Kasparov back on the board. Then we've solved the daily puzzle. Now it's time to check in with the chat, say hi to everybody, and then let's review some of these really instructive moments from yesterday's chess. Uh, I, I was just, like I said, I mean, it's just amazing to see Gary playing this well. Um, and uh, Danny, what did you make of Naka being a bit rude, unsportsmanlike to the Kuang Liam? Yeah, I didn't really like that. I didn't really like his, uh, his, quick, his quick sort of like handshake and walk away. I think that... Um, I don't know. I didn't really think that was the best behavior by Hikaru. I know he was frustrated. Nobody likes losing games in that sense, and certainly Hikaru didn't quite find himself. I mean, really, if you want to talk storylines from yesterday's show, and let's let's move over and then just dive right into it, because a lot of people want to talk Gary Kasparov's return. A lot of people want to talk Hikaru Nakamura struggling in the rapid. But if you want to talk about the storyline that isn't actually Gary Kasparov's play, which we're going to get into, it's probably the, the, you know, the not, not great play by Hikaru yesterday. But a, a team member of mine made an interesting observation, which I, which I didn't really realize is true. And then I thought about it, and I thought, yeah, you know, he's right. And he said that you know, Hikaru, Hikaru doesn't always perform that well in the rapid portions of these events. You know, if you look back over the last couple of years of the Grand Chess Tour in, in Leuven um, and in Paris, now we have the St. Louis portion. I don't know that Rapid is exactly Hikaru's jam, right? We know him as this incredible blitz and bullet player. Rapid is like this little middle ground, right? Where it's like, 
notice that he tends to play almost too fast and make blunders against guys like Laquan Liem, uh, and, and they actually have the time to punish him, whereas they don't normally have the time to punish some of his mistakes and blitz, and certainly not bullets. So, so um, an observation made by one of my teammates yesterday, I forget who it was, someone on the content team, might have been Sam um, or Mike, but yeah, I mean, I don't know that Hikaru is exactly at his best in rapid, and certainly the storyline outside of Gary Kasparov's awesome play has been that the pre-tournament favorite, Hikaru Nakamura, has really not played that well. Um, obviously, my boy MVL, you know, getting involved in social media, talking about him eagerly awaiting. Maxime is joining us here today. I, he just wants to say hi. Hey, buddy, how you doing? You just won the Singfield Cup? Oh, what's that? Oh, the title you only really cared about was beating me at giant chess. I know. Yep, yeah, the videos are coming out this week. Everyone's going to be able to see the videos where you and I battled in giant chess. You played really well this year. Just wanted to say that. You really improved your chess this year. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for joining the show. Maxime Vachet Legrave, everybody. Um, all right. So let's dive into the games. We're going to roll right past the, uh, the Karyakin game. A bit of a solid uh, Russian on Russian draw. But the moves that I, the game I want to dive into is this one here because the one with Hikaru, uh, after a bit of a weird opening, sort of a dubious approach by the American, Kasparov is better. But Hikaru, Hikaru showed why he's the one still in the top, you know, 10 in the world and not Gary Kasparov. And he outplayed Gary over the, over the remaining. Uh, course of the game and at this point you think he's going to win I want to highlight that F4 really is a strong move and one of the big reasons for it is uh, obviously Kasparov praised it but one of the things that you um, you evaluate in end games where it's an open center semi open and you have two bishops normally you would favor the bishop's chances but as long as white can create inroads for the king and as long as the knights remain in the center usually a centralized knight can you know can compete on on equal equal terms with with a bishop even in the open board uh you know knights that are struggling dynamically to make choices do i go to the king side or the queen side that's where the bishop dominates right but if the knights are in the center they're usually in control and this looked like a game that, that nakamura was now going to put things away f4 check is key because like i said as long as you have inroads and exactly what that does is it opens up the f3 square and uh, he immediately, as they said, pounces on knight f5 check, which is the correct transition, eliminating the bishop here. But even more importantly, taking away any and all winning chances, like if, if Hikaru like, blundered, because you get rid of this light square bishop, which maybe h3 is a target, whatever, right? So this was just the right practical decision. Seems like Hikaru is on his way to a win. The knight re-centralizes itself. And then we're going to get to the critical moment here, which if you didn't see the game starting in this position right now, when d5 falls and the king takes on f7, uh, the big decision is how, how to proceed, right? You, you, you've managed to keep the knight centralized the entire time. As we said, that's what you got to do against the bishops. And you've, you've won a pawn by a, and eliminated all of black's chances. Should be a pretty clear road to victory. Uh, but no, Hikaru makes the wrong choice here. So this was, this was really uh, surprising. He had the time to do it. Um, thanks, uh, Gardner21, now following chess. Appreciate it. Uh, here, the, the, um, the right decision, I already actually had the, uh, the analysis board up just so you could see the engines uh, agree as well because some of you really like to question all chess analysis. Um, I'll do my best Maurice Ashley impersonation and just quote the engine. Uh, just kidding. Um, the, uh, okay, the, the, the straightforward approach is... And, and the, the clear one to win is the move king to c4, not the one chosen in the game. In hindsight, it seems 2020, like how could Ikaro miss this, right? I mean, as the game goes forward, the white king obviously reaches its goal to both shoulder the black king, preventing any further defensive inroads. And one of the key things about this line that makes it so obviously winning is that when you, when you advance this pawn, it's not even just that you're going to come forward and, and let the bishop sacrifice. You know, maybe then you have to worry right is this king going to get back to the corner in time no that's not really the plan one of the things that you want to do in these types of end games if the bishop just sits is make sure you have your king and knight set up to work together okay on on blocking the bishop's diagonal uh, lots of people coming in with the with the follows nice okay so um after bishop g1 the point is that if the position just sits the easiest the easiest road to victory is going to be moves like knight to v6 uh and now 
Yeah, it, it, especially because the king can't get to the corner, so there's no opportunity to trade and go king c8. He's blocked out just in time. So with the threat of knight to b6 coming that blocks the bishop's protection of a7, this is just a really easy win. And the reason I wanted to highlight it is because it is instructive for, for members who maybe don't have as much experience playing these types of endgames. When you're one of the common mistakes made in these uh, these minor piece endings is is following just straightforward with the plan, assuming at some point you'll use this pawn and get them to sacrifice the piece for it. You have to be really careful if your plan is just to let them sacrifice, because in some cases the king will get back in time, whether that's eliminating your only real remaining chance to win, right, because you can't checkmate with a king and knight the last time we checked, um, or whether that's uh, getting, you know, if you had the wrong color bishop for a corner, for example, right, then those situations you can't even win even if you have an extra minor piece. So. Be careful if your evaluation in these endgames is a straightforward plan to let them just sacrifice their minor piece for, for a pawn. When using uh, the king and knight against the bishop, this, this uh, instructive idea where you block the diagonal is just a really good one to always have as sort of the goal position um, as you think ahead. Uh, you know, that said, it seems like king e4 should also be winning. This bishop is still stuck guarding both sides of the board. But now that now the story flips and you go back to seeing that Kasparov just played um, just super high quality defensive chess. After king e4, king e6, you know, this game goes pretty straightforward, and I don't know that there were any other chances for white to win. Uh, Nakamura not correctly, uh, same idea. He's gonna, what you're gonna notice is he's gonna consistently put the knight in front of this bishop's diagonal. As we said, that's what the king and knight wanna do to push the pawn. The problem is he just isn't quite fast enough, and that black king gets back just in time. As soon as the king reaches those diagonals where, where the white king was unable to shoulder him, like reach f7, this position is a draw because the king on e7 can guard those critical squares, f6 and g7, preventing that knight from blocking the diagonal. Let's go to the end of it using chess.com slash analysis and using our, you know, when you're in these positions, if the knight ever gets into a, a position where it's threatening to go to g7, the bishop will either be on on h8 or the king will be on f8 guarding it, depending on how you're doing it. If the knight is ever threatening to go to f6, this king will be on e7, and so it's really just a dance. There's no way for white to force his way into a position where, where the knight can, for example, be on a square like g7 when this bishop is over here blocked from the h8 square. So awesome Russian technique there from the former world champ. Uh, having having seen him just go through the process of being better and then losing and then saving, I mean, that's real chess, right? That's the kind of nervous situation you can't be in, uh, you know, unless you're playing. So to see him get through that, I think, was huge. Uh, obviously, big shout out to my boy, John Urschel. He'll be joining us again on Amateur. All of a sudden, John retires from the NFL and he's stealing everyone's spotlight in the chess world. What gives, John? You know what? I mean, they've never given me a jacket. And they just give you a St. Louis jacket. Whatever, right? Whatever, John. Although this was hilarious. Obviously, Dan, Anton squared me. You got to follow him on Twitter. <laughs> Catching the Nepo awkward moment. Look at this. How hilarious. And it's classic Nepomniachi. If you were there in St. Louis, I was there uh, last week. Nepo always seems to be like walking by people in tight corners. So that was... Uh, <laughs> that was pretty funny. I just love I love seeing that over and over again. Nepo, hey, hey Nepo, the tournament's starting. You want to get to your chair? Hey, hey Nepo, bathroom break. Last call for bathroom was five minutes ago. Hey Nepo, um, these aisles are only made for two people, and one of them's John Urschel, big guy. And, and Tony's not the smallest guy either, right? I mean, Tony Rich is not the not the smallest person. So, pretty hilarious stuff. All right, let's move on to the next game. Uh, this one was also. An instructive one. Here it was a bit of the opposite case with Hikaru. I thought that I thought that Kasparov was on the gr on on the train to Grindtown, uh, playing against the isolated queen pawn. Should we grab the PGN? Let's grab the PGN, and then uh, go go do a new analysis session. If you're wondering how to do this, just go to chess.com/analysis, and you can you can just load it up and and you can now actually save and share anything you do. By the way, after you do an analysis session, and let's say you add something like you know. Caspi on his way to grind town, right? Population IQP. Once you do things like that, you can just click this little share button and uh, instantly save and share any analysis you do. It's forever saved. So pretty cool to share any kind of analysis or puzzles or studies or openings or anything you do. Um, 
All right, so uh, Queen A4 was played. Rook D2 is preparing the process of, of doubling, and but Lanier Dominguez is also still playing chess at a pretty high level, playing D4 here. That's exactly the kind of thing you want to do, and that's why I wanted to highlight this one as well over the Karyakin one. Instructive to know that if you're on the road, if you're on the opposite end of that train to Grindtown, you don't want to be brought to its final location. This metaphor got weird about five minutes ago, but get off the train to Grindtown and head on the train to Simplificationville. Okay, Simplificationville is when you push your isolated queen pawn. It's usually worth it, even if you can't immediately regain the pawn, rather than allowing your opponent to continue along a plan, you know, where you're just gonna play buckle down analysis and hope that you don't get crushed, right? I mean, here A7's probably hanging. But the point is, in these situations, all of your major pieces guarding a single pawn is exactly what you don't want in an isolated queen pawn scenario looking for any dynamic opportunity to simplify and open up the position can help turn the tables and, and allow Black's pieces to come to life. So that's exactly what Dominguez does here. Uh, and despite losing the pawn, he had already calculated, I think, kind of this whole simplification idea with the queen coming to b4. And it's pretty much all based on the idea that at least as far as the analysis went on TV, uh, both Maurice and Yasser seemed pretty convinced that, that Gary had missed this next move, rook to c1. Um, this move threatens to win on the spot, right? You can no longer just take on b7 because queen takes d2 is, is, is lights out, and now black is up a rook. So rook to c1 is an instructive way to sort of force further trades. And it all, you know, even though it's just a big, massive trade, at the end of these lines, you're looking at a position here where, you know, really it's just a draw, but if anything, black is in the driver's seat. Compare this position here to the one that started in this situation where black was, you know, on the train as a passenger to Grindtown, and he got off that train, headed to Simplificationville, and... Um, and save the day. So instructive there. I think that many members, you know, would find that interesting because I think often weaknesses in your camp are, are recognized a little too late. And now, you know, your opponent has built up and coordinated all their forces, and you lose the ice at a queen pawn for no compensation. And uh, you know, that's how you that's how you get uh, outplayed. So, all right, those were the instructive moments that I prepared. Believe it or not, I prepared for today's Chess Today show. Pew! Right? Hashtag mind blown, Danny. You did some sort of work that didn't involve acting like a jackass on TV. I know, you're welcome. Um, but uh, the truth is, I just wanted to highlight those two things because I thought the isolated queen pawn defensive mindset as well as those instructive moments in the knight versus bishop ending were worth it. Um, I wanted to get through all of that before I dove into the chat, and uh, but let's do that now and say hi just because we have a pretty active chat. A lot of people here um, just... Both chats, Bobby the Sailor, what's up, man? Just Mud, I don't, I don't want to read all your names. Let's just say I'm looking at the Twitch chat, and if you have any questions or comments about what you've seen so far, whether that be the X's and O's, or whether it be the, um, you know, the topic of Gary Kasparov or Hikaru Nakamura's less than ideal play um, in the rapid portion, go ahead. Now's your chance. The Chess TV chat, what's going on? Uh, we got a pretty, pretty good turnout here as well. The Raging Ghetto. Um, can I go over, uh, I don't know that I have more time to do more of the X's and O's here. Believe it or not, I'm on a time limit today because we have another show starting right at 10 a.m. It's been a busy day today, today on Chess TV. You've already witnessed Spicy Chess, which was a ton of fun with Grandmaster Simon Williams. The Chess Today show will be getting offline, and right after that, if we go to the, uh, the Chess TV calendar, we have, we have uh, Master vs. Many with Grandmaster Dayon Boykoff starting, starting right now. Uh, then, of course, we have the Grand Chess Tour continuation, the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. So it's pretty much all day, all night. Lionel Richie is singing a song about Chess TV um, right now. And by the way, if you're not if you're not in these Master vs. Many games, let me give a quick shout out. Um, these are a lot of fun. I mean, obviously, there's a pretty consistent number of about 5,000 of you competing. Um, this game here with uh, Grandmaster Melikachian is also super interesting. Melik is white, the world is black. I'm actually playing on the world side. I should probably get involved in the voting. Uh, it's Melik's move right now. I've only played a few moves, but Master vs. Many is now a uh, is a uh, something that Chess.com is doing every month. On the first of every month, we start a new game where the members, that's all of you, get to take on some sort of chess celebrity, some sort of chess grandmaster, somebody who you know, whether it's via video content like Boykoff and Melikachian or something else. So, um, 
what is where is the where's the upcoming games? Um, open games. Let's go to upcoming games. So we got. I am uh, Anna Rudolph starts her game in September. Where's um. Where is the. Where's the Boykoff game? Did the Boykoff game already finished? I got some of my own games here. Let's go back to the Vote Chess. Upcoming games. For some reason, I'm not seeing the Grandmaster Day on Boykoff game here. So, uh, I don't know exactly how to find that. Um, I thought that I thought that it was I thought that it wasn't started yet. But okay. You can go go to the vote chess and, and join another game. Maybe maybe that game is already completed and is a wrap up show. I actually lost track of the master versus many schedule. Hashtag guilty. So um, hi Danny, notice me. What's up, Sanjay? Let's check with Maurice on the engine re- <laughs> Uh Yeah yeah, um, that was funny. Uh, Danny's reading the Chitch Twitch chat and is and the Chess TV chat. Israel Blunderson, I read all chats all the time. I'm like like. It's like when I tell my kids, like, you know when you know your kids do something and then you, you know, you make up that age-old parent lie, I have eyes in the back of my head. How did you know I was doing that? I have eyes in the back of my head. And no matter what, until they get like to 14 or 15, there's always a brief glimmer where they consider the possibility that it's true, that you actually do have eyes in the back of your head. No matter what kids say later, there's that like, Okay, no, right? I mean, but there's that moment where they consider it. So when I tell all of you guys that I'm reading the Twitch chat all the time, you're like, we all know Danny neglects the Twitch chat, but wait a second. Does he really? Is he always there? And then every once in a while I comment on a chess bra show and people are like, oh my God, because he's watching. I better stop cursing and spamming the chat. Um, so uh, anyway, let's... Uh, Let's let us let us let us get the conversation back to, to chess. Come to daddy, don't be shy. Uh, the uh, the the Twitch chat. I do read. I do read Cutford. I read both chats. As I said, I'm reading chat all the time. And then you get that moment. Is he really, or is he not? I don't know. But what we do know is that uh, right now I got to get off the air because Master versus Many with Grandmaster Day on Boykov. I'm gonna go ahead and check the shedge. I'm going to check the shedge right now and just make sure that uh, Mr. Boykov is ready. Uh, looks like he is getting ready to be ready. Um, so let's play a bullet game real quick while I wait for final confirmation. Let's play a bullet game real quick while we wait for final confirmation that Grandmaster Dan Boykov is about to start Master vs. Many. Again, go to go to chess.com's Vote Chess page and join the show. If it turns out that the Master vs. Many game with Dan Boykov is still going, like it's in progress and 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 I couldn't find it, that's going to be disappointing. And I am I am indeed going to uh, make some complaints about that. We'll get that fixed. But I think I think I mean obviously I know that the um, is it in the open seeks tab? No, there's no because you can also set a vote chest with your tab. So I feel like there should be an easier view of some of these public, these upcoming public games. Oh, public games. Let's do that. Oh, okay. Wait, no. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, so it is. So that's how I join. Okay, so I should go to vote chest. I love when I complain about my own site and then find out that things work fine. That's one of my favorite things. Okay, so I have now joined. The vote chess game of of uh, Grandmaster Dan Boykov, and uh, and you can too, everybody. I'll go ahead and share the uh, share the link in the chat. You can go you can go join the vote chess game if you're if you're into that sort of thing. Thanks for all the follows. Sorry, I'm not giving all you guys new shout outs. Let's get some subscriber shout out, some subscriber love. Um, all right, let's go play. All right, we're voting here in the game with Dan Boykov. I'm gonna wait a minute, but I am gonna go play. A, uh, a quick bullet game. Let's play one quick bullet game to bring the show to a close. And then I'm going to assume Dayon is ready. And we're going to close the gates, open the door, whatever that is. All right, who am I playing here? This is going to be funsies. Funsies. Little Carol Khan. Hi, everybody. Thanks. I'm super. Thanks for asking. All right, I'm going to play C5. This isn't the best line. He's going to, oh, he should play Knight E4. Ooh, he didn't. Me likey. Supposed to play knight e4 uh, after c5 immediately. That's usually why you don't like the bishop on g5 in those lines. This is a big mistake. And he's about to run into uh, some problems, I believe. 
with that pass pawn. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong, but I could be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time I was terribly wrong. But normally, this is less than ideal. I almost have c7, right? I mean, that's how crazy this position gets. I'm just going to play rook here. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is actually trying to play good chess and bullet. I'm going to keep that pawn on c6 like a thorn in his side. And then I'm going to, whoa, town. Um, OK, I have to move this guy, apparently. Can he actually even go after my e6 pawn? I don't even know. I hardly have any clue what's going on here. Okay, this is about to get real wild and wacky. Uh, this is about to get real wild and wacky. At least I got Rekarovka. Uncle Sasha would be proud. Duh! Come get me, you chestnut comrade! I kill you today. Today is the day of the chestnut comrades. We're going to do it. Uh, no. I do not like, I am losing this position. Ay, 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 a crazy chess I'll play today. I play crazy chess, I'm going to lose it all. I could have taken his rook with check, this was terrible. Blunder, I could have taken this rook again. Da! The chestnut comrades! You get a victory from Uncle Sasha before I sign out. All right. Welcome and enjoy the show with Grandmaster Dayan Boykov. Thank you for being here, chestnut comrades. And go back. Da! I am out. This is a good chest today show. That's for Danya.